Luke 10 is one of these passages that I really haven't studied much before. I mean, the 70 are sent out, they return, whoop, big deal. But in preparing this video, I spent quite a bit of time looking at this text. And really, there's a lot more here than meets the eyes. And I discovered and learned a great deal. So part of this video is going to be the exploration and discovery process of what I've learned with you. So let's read our passage, Luke 10, 1 through 11, and then 16 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking, whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Verse 16, whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs, Matthew 10 and Mark 6. Only Luke recounts the mission of the 70, and by placing it in Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, right after he entered Samaria, the focus of the disciples is expanded to cover more than just the towns and villages that dot the Jewish countryside, but it includes the Gentiles as well. Why the 70? Earlier in chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, Jesus had sent the 12 out on a mission. Now he sends 70. First, this indicates that Jesus had a larger group following him around the countryside than just the 12. But why 70? It might be a reference back to Genesis 10, where the nations of the world are listed and there are 70 nations listed. Or it might be an intertextual reference to the 70 elders that Moses appointed in Exodus, Exodus 24.1 and Numbers 11.16. However, I think that the current location in Luke's narrative is that they're somewhere in Samaria. We're not sure exactly, but that's what's implied. However, given that Luke puts this or implies that this is taking place in Samaria during Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, and that the book of Luke and Acts are two parts of one combined work, I think it's better to see the 70 as foreshadowing the disciples' commission in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Verse 2. The harvest is plentiful. It's at this point that I would like to cut in some luscious B-roll video of rolling waves of wheat or some other crop. Why? Because that is one of the magical features of video. I can take you there for a few moments to illustrate this idea. The other thing is, every time I read this passage, the harvest is plentiful, I always conjure up images of rolling fields of wheat, but it could be grapes or some sort of crops in the trees or another plant. What crop comes to mind for you when you read this passage? What do you picture when you read, the harvest is plentiful? 
Now in Luke 5.10, Jesus told Peter, don't be afraid, from now on you're going to be fishers of men. Here he uses another metaphor for ministry. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now this idea of the harvest is plentiful has generated a great deal of discussion and thought through the centuries. First, some look to the Old Testament for the background to this metaphor, especially Isaiah 27.2, in which case the harvest is Israel. Others look at this language of harvest and wonder if a better term could have been used. What does it mean to be harvested? How am I harvested? Should we even talk about harvesting people? It tends to carry a lot of negative connotations. If we go back to the follow me passage in Luke chapter 9 that I covered in the last video, I think it makes more sense to see this harvest is plentiful as a continuation of that dialogue. In Luke 9, Jesus talked about the idea that no one putting their hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's a metaphor that's taken from agriculture, and that metaphorical family continues here as well. It's a picture of a field ripe for harvest, but not enough workers. While the harvest points to the end of the farming cycle and brings about a sense of urgency. It also ties back to Jesus setting his face to Jerusalem. There is not much time left before Jesus will be crucified. So this metaphor combines and communicates both the urgency of the hour and also that there's sort of an end times or an apocalyptic type tone in this passage. One thing that we know for certain is that Jesus often used the idea of the harvest to speak about the end of the age. So I think we can legitimately say that Jesus' instructions here are laced with urgency that the end of this age is coming. In Matthew 13, 39, he talks about how the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. In John 4, 35, John records Jesus as saying, don't say that there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. This entire passage that we are reading today is permeated with ideas, images, and language that is very apocalyptic or end times in nature. For example, the reference to Satan falling like lightning from heaven towards the end of this reading is very apocalyptic in both nature and language. In 10.3, the idea of being a lamb among the wolves creates the picture of being completely defenseless, helpless, and being in grave danger. 10.4, carrying no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greeting no one on the road. The medieval church really embraced the instructions in this passage. Literally. Orders like those founded by St. Francis of Assisi embraced these virtues. Those in ministry were not to accumulate any wealth. Rather, they were to rely on their needs being met by those who they ministered to. Now, this not greeting anyone along the way may have been intended to communicate the urgency of the hour. Don't stop and talk to people. There's not enough time. 10.5. Whatever house you first enter, First say, peace to this house. Hospitality was an essential virtue in that culture. There were no motel chains or Airbnb. Usually, though, you would find your hospitality through family or other networks. Here, though, it seems like the disciples are going out cold to these villages. When we lived in England, one of the chaplains at our church that worked with young people traveled to Iran and backpacked around that country. One of the comments that I remember to this day about his travels was the incredible hospitality that he experienced. When he first arrived in Iran, he asked fellow Iranian travelers how they found places to stay in the various towns and villages that he would pass through. Their comment was, go to the market square and just stand there. So this is what he did. And he was amazed by how quickly and warmly the local people who he had never met before would approach him and tell him that he was staying in their homes that night. And sometimes friendly arguments broke out between the locals about who should have the privilege of having him stay in their house, a value of hospitality that I don't think many Western countries can even begin to comprehend. The disciples share in the same vulnerability of Jesus the one who had no place to lay his head, and they depended upon the hospitality of others. I've been in numerous situations in other countries where I was dependent on the hospitality of the households there while I was teaching there. 
On the one hand, you can't help but feel incredibly blessed and humbled by how generous they are and how welcome they make you feel. On the other hand, it's a position of vulnerability. You are totally dependent on them for some place to sleep, the roof over your head, and the food that is set before you. It really teaches you in a very deep and dramatic way just how organic the body of Christ is. 10.7. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. This is another interesting aspect to Jesus' instructions, especially if you consider the dietary restrictions of the Jewish community. Jesus commands the 70 to eat and drink what they are served. On the one hand, this requires a little bit of digestive fortitude here when you encounter some food that you have never seen before. On the other hand, what if they were served pork, which the Jewish followers were forbidden to eat? Once again, our values are turned upside down in light of the kingdom. We are to eat whatever is served before us. Once again, this sets up a theme within the book of Acts. One of the big ideas in the book of Acts from chapter 10 through 15 concerns how are the Jewish believers going to eat with the Gentile believers within the church? Because the Gentile believers eat food that was forbidden for the Jewish community. So what's to be done here? This passage foreshadows that a little bit because here we see the disciples being commanded to eat whatever is served before them. In Jesus' instructions here, we see sort of three aspects to this mission. Peace. Whenever the disciples were to enter a house or a village, they were to bless it with a greeting of peace. When I was considering how to close these videos, I settled on the word peace at the very end. It's not just some warm, blue, fuzzy feeling in our life but that you and I are in a good relationship and that you live at peace with God and in healthy, sound relationships with those around you based on openness, acceptance, honesty, and the very active embrace of God's love. The second aspect of ministry here is healing. They are to cure the sick. Preaching, the third aspect of the ministry. They are to say that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Jesus uses this phrase twice in these instructions, in verse 9 and verse 11. And when you see something repeated, it's being repeated for an important reason. In this way, the preaching of the disciples matches Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of heaven is dawning and is very near. Now we have to skip down to verse 17. The 70 return with joy, saying that, Lord, in your name, even the disciples, the disciples, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. Now, earlier, Jesus told them that they are to preach that the kingdom of God is coming near or the kingdom of God is upon you. Here, the fact that the disciples have authority over the demons is confirmation of that message. As God's kingdom breaks into this world, it reverses the effects of the fall and the corruption of human nature. And that is demonstrated here in verse 17. During the time of the New Testament, exorcisms were a common form of what we might call medical treatment today, especially in regard to mental illness. Treatment by exorcism was often very complicated and a lengthy, complicated process. So the disciples are amazed, not just that it's happening, but how it's taking place in a very simple manner, just by using Jesus' name. This idea will get picked up and developed in the book of Acts, but one of the key things that sets Jesus apart from other miracle workers during his day was the simplicity of how this was done. And the same was true for the early church in the book of Acts. It's not based upon knowing certain prayers or formulas or rituals. It is based upon God's presence being brought into that situation in the person of Christ or his representatives calling on Jesus or God to intervene in this situation on this person's behalf. Now, I have a whole series of lectures that I usually give my students in seminary on medicine, miracles, and magic that explores this topic. And someday, when I have the time, I hope to make a whole series of videos on that topic as well. If this topic interests you, let me know in the comments down below and it'll help me determine just how much interest there is. Verse 18. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. 
At this point, we definitely need to cut to some good B-roll video. Verse 20 really closes this passage on sort of a very anticlimactic note. The disciples are not to rejoice over the success that they have had in ministry, but that their names are written in heaven. Once again, the values of the kingdom are so different from how we see things today. We measure success in many ways based on numbers. How many people attend our church? This is a huge trap on YouTube as well. How many people watch the videos? How many people are subscribed to your channel? Now, on the one hand, that helps YouTube know, oh, this is a great video and we need to recommend it to other people. On the other hand, you can really get in the trap that you measure your success by those numbers. So this passage is a great reminder of having the correct perspective, especially for me. For the disciples, as they were experiencing real power with healings and casting out demons, they had a real taste of power and success. But Jesus says, don't rejoice over that. Rather, take an eternal perspective and look at what God has done for you. Your name is written in heaven. Summary. So how do we pull all these ideas in this passage together and what does it mean for us today? First, the harvest is plentiful. This image conveys the abundant nature of ministry. The crop is ready to be collected and there is an urgency so it does not fall to the ground and rot. At the same time, it contains notes from the end times or apocalyptic type ideas. Second big point, dependence on the generosity of others. The 70 are commanded not to take money or provisions with them, but to receive hospitality from others to have their needs met. Most people today are more accustomed to giving to meet the needs of others, not placing themselves in a situation of being dependent upon them to meet their needs. This passage challenges our values today for being self-supporting, not dependent on others, not being dependent upon the government for, to meet our needs. Yet this position of humility and dependence is exactly what Christ commanded the disciples to place themselves in. Vulnerable peace. As they went out on their mission, the 70 were to proclaim and spread peace to the houses and villages that they stayed in. This is so different from how many believers see their relationship to the world around them. I think many American churches approach the wider culture with sort of a wartime mentality rather than being agents of peace. It's us against them. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys, and we need to make sure we stand our ground and overcome them. That's not the value that Jesus is teaching. At the same time, the disciples are to be vulnerable. They are going out as sheep among wolves. The same reception that awaits Jesus when he arrives in Jerusalem is hinted at in his warning to them as well. But instead of cursing these people, we are to extend the blessing of peace. And if someone is receptive, this blessing of peace shall rest upon them. Those who do not, those who do not value this message of peace, then this blessing will not rest upon them. But the disciples are not allowed to engage in any sort of retaliatory action. All they are allowed to do is shake the dust off from their feet. Third big idea in this passage, eternal perspective. Jesus' statement about seeing Satan fall like lightning and having their names written in the book of heaven all point to a heavenly or eternal perspective of what the disciples were engaged in. From their perspective, they saw themselves as going from village to village, talking with the people there, healing some people. Jesus wants them to see that this has implications that go far beyond their walking around and healing people or preaching the message. It involves eternity and it has a heavenly perspective. And we need to keep our eyes on that rather than this little point of time in which we occupy now. I hope you've enjoyed this walk through Luke chapter 10. I really enjoyed studying it for this past week and preparing this video. It's a passage that I hadn't studied much before and I learned a great deal from it. I hope you did as well. Until next week's video, 
I'm going to leave you with the blessing of peace. Peace.